All right, today we have Dr. James Hildreth. He's Meharry's 12th president and CEO. Dr. Hildreth, I'm going to run through your bio a little bit, just real, real brief. It's extremely impressive, so I want to go through it. Uh, you're the first African-American Rhodes Scholar from Arkansas. You have a degree in chemistry from Harvard. You have a PhD in immunology from Oxford. You have an MD from Johns Hopkins. You're the first African-American in the history of John Hopkins School of Medicine to earn full professorship with tenure in the basic sciences. You're the director of the Center for IDS Health Disparities Research at Meharry. You have an honorary doctorate from the University of Arkansas. You're in the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame. You're on the Harvard University Board of Overseers. You were the Dean of College of the Dean of College of Biological Sciences at the University of California, Davis. You're the first Black Dean at that university, and you're Meharry's 12th President and CEO. With everything that you've done so far, Dr. Hildreth, what's your why and what motivates you to keep making meaningful strides when you have already accomplished so much? Uh, well, Todd, I, I think it all comes down to trying to fulfill the purpose I think that has been given to me by the by the creator uh, and just trying to make the best use of my gifts to first of all to inspire others to to live out their dreams and when I talk to young people and have a chance to talk to a lot of young people I always end by saying whatever you have a passion for give yourself permission to do that because if you do that you won't have a great job or a great career, you have a great life. And I think I have a great life because I honestly believe that what I'm doing now is what I was created to do. And there's no better feeling than having a perfect match between your instincts, your abilities, your aspirations, all of those being fulfilled by the, the work that you do. It's an amazing thing. And I just feel so blessed. You know, and that's what I wish for everyone. I wish for everyone to have Great health first. That's mm -hmm. always my first wish for people. Yes. But my second is for them to love what they do and to be able to make a living doing that. Right. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it makes sense. Now, when I was just in the wild six months ago when COVID was just coming out, uh -huh. I saw a video of you explaining COVID and you probably had the best explanation for it. Can you explain COVID in a Let's say uh, on an eighth grade level for us. So the COVID-19 disease is caused by a virus that's been named SARS-CoV-2. And the SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And that might sound familiar to you because back in 2000, there was another SARS pandemic caused by another virus that's a close cousin to this virus. And what people need to understand is that this is the third pandemic of this decade, of this century, that's been caused by coronavirus. Mm. And you may think, well, in 2000, we didn't have this sort of worldwide phenomenon. And in 2012, we didn't have it. And there's the, here's the difference. These viruses all belong to a large family. There are 39 members of the family. And they mostly are indigenous to bats which means that you would normally get exposed to these viruses unless you came into contact with a bat. Well, with SARS and mirrors of 2012, there were intermediate hosts. For SARS, it was these small hand animals that look like cats. I think they're called privets. And then for mirrors, it was camels. So unless you came into contact with those cats or the camels, you could not get those other viruses. In other words, the vectors or the means of transmission for those first two were these animals. The difference now is that we are the vectors for SARS-CoV-2 because this virus has adopted to be spread from one human to another. And when viruses adopt for human to human spread and they can be spread through the air, that's when pandemics, pandemics occur, just like 1918 with influenza. So the fact that human beings are the vectors and the virus can be transmitted through air. That is the main reason why this has become a global epidemic 
uh, unlike any we've seen in 102 years. And that's why, because we are the vector. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Now, quick question that has to do with this, but it doesn't. A lot of times people that are extremely smart, extremely accomplished, they know their subject, but can't communicate it well. What allows you to be able to communicate well for someone that may not be or may have not accomplished as much? Uh, well, first, thank you for for that. <laughs> I'm not sure that I explain it all that well, because sometimes I want to go back and change a couple of things. But I, I say to people that, you know, I've been studying viruses since 1978 when I did a undergraduate project on flu at Harvard. Mm -hmm. So if if in 42 years I don't understand this stuff, uh, that would not be good to have spent four decades studying something and not understanding it. Um, but, I, but I think the communication piece comes from uh, enjoying teaching. And I started teaching when I was, you know, uh, at Oxford actually tutoring uh, some kids. And I got frustrated by not being able to connect <laughs> with, with, those, with those kids. So I started thinking about how can I make this accessible to them? And I try to find ways to break the scientific concept down in a way that people can, can relate to them. And sometimes that means telling a story or sometimes that means comparing a complex scientific idea to something more simple. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I still think that I'm struggling to do it better, but I do appreciate the fact that people seem to think that I can make it understandable. So, but I'm still working at it. <laughs> so how but, do you, how do you part of it, But part of it though is, let me emphasize that if after studying something for 42 years, I didn't really understand it. That would be bad. Right, right, right. <laughs> now, now, where does the humility come from? Does it come from your upbringing? Does it come from learning? Uh, or? Well, uh, to be honest, I, I just wrote about this. I think it was a gift from my mother who uh, really taught me how powerful it can be because uh, she, she, she always told me that I had some great things in store for me, but that they would not happen unless I always remembered where the credit belonged. And, you know, being a person of faith, I like to tell people that my humility is actually a form of arrogance, right? And let me explain that when you know that your fate and your life has been predetermined by, by the creator, you don't need to worry about impressing anybody or trying to show off your abilities. You don't need any of that because you know, <laughs> you know that ultimately what's going to happen to you in your life and your success or failures or whatever have been determined by the person that created or the, the creator himself. And so for me, that's why I guess I can be humble because I just know that there's a plan for my life. And if I'm obedient, that good things will happen. And so that's where the humility comes from. It comes from my faith. That's one of the best one of the best answers I've ever heard about where humility comes from. Uh, for me, that's it. Yeah, that's true. Now, when you're recruiting for Meharry, do you look for humility in very gifted students? Well, we well, I think uh maybe maybe we do because I like to explain to people that. The medical school admissions process, same thing for dental school as well and graduate school. You know, you, you fill out an application, you provide your transcript, you have letters from professors and people that know you, and all those things are fine. But one of the most important questions that we ask <laughs> is not a question we ask the students. It's a question we ask ourselves once the student has stepped out of the room. And that question, Todd, is would I want that person taking care of members of my family? Would I want that person taking care of my child or my mother? And if the answer is no, you could have a perfect GPA, the highest possible MCAT score, it wouldn't matter. You're not getting in. Because, because being a good physician means that you're a humanist and you can be a humanist 
unless you have a way to connect with people. And that's really part of that third pillar of medicine. Medicine has three pillars. There's the science of medicine, the business of medicine, and the art of medicine. And increasingly, the science and business have overshadowed the art, but we're trying to make sure the art does not get lost. And that's the piece where you as a human are connecting to another human. And that's that's what I'm so proud about, Meharry, is that we preserved, been jealous <laughs> of preserving that piece of what we do is to make sure that we're sending out people who are humanists, who can take care of folks in the most fundamental way. So that's that's a big part of it. Now, a top a top doctor, is that talent or is that something that can be nurtured or is it both? I think is I think it's both. Uh, people are motivated to medicine for different reasons. But at the end of the day, most people do it because of the satisfaction it gets you get from restoring the wholeness uh, to someone who's broken. That can be, you know, physically or emotionally or otherwise. But there, there's just a great feeling that comes from knowing that you played us a part in restoring the health and sometimes but restoring the dignity of a person who's come to you. And as far as I'm concerned, when you go see a doctor, you're putting your most precious possession in their charge. Our health is the most important, precious thing that we all have. So we try to emphasize to our students that when you're sitting across from a patient, they're entrusting you with the thing that's most valuable to them. And that requires that you be respectful, you treat them with dignity, and of course you offer them your best in terms of trying to help them. And that's kind of how we approach it here. It's, it's all about what's on the inside. I mean, what, what motivates you, why, why you want to be a doctor. And I'm so happy, Todd, that we seem to attract students who really do have a spirit of service, wanting to, to do this for the right reasons. And for the last uh, decade or more, 80% of our students have gone to serve people in underserved areas. And that's quite remarkable. And it is, just reflects who they are and why they want to do what they do. Nice. So last week, last week, Meharry received 34 million from Bloomberg Philanthropies to increase the number of black doctors in the U.S. and help improve health care and minorities. Can you explain the disparity minorities receive in health care and if those disparities have a direct correlation to the amount of black doctors there are? Yes. Uh, well, just uh, some numbers first. You know, so African-Americans make up 13 percent of the population but we're just under 5% of all the doctors in the country. So there's a huge gap between our portion of the population and our proportion of doctors. And there's good evidence that when African-Americans are taken care of by African-Americans, the outcomes are better. And I would argue, and I think there's evidence to support it. It's all about what I was speaking about earlier, having a connection on a human level with the person that you've entrusted your health to. And that's easier when the person sitting across from you uh, is of the same gender, same race, same culture. All those things matter. One really startling to statistic I saw the other day from George Mason University, they looked at 1800, I think, uh, newborn babies and compared the outcomes when those babies were cared for by black pediatricians and, and OBGYNs and mothers versus white. And, you know, I had to read this a couple of times, but the black babies taken care of by the black doctors were three times more likely to survive than if they were t being taken care of by white doctors. Now, let me just say and emphasize that white physicians offer really good care to black folks every day. So it's not, it's not, that there's not good service being offered. But I honestly think it, it relates to this trust issue and being able to relate to the person. Because when you get right down to it, a good history and physical is still key to providing good medicine. And histories, when you take them, requires that that person divulge to you some very, very <laughs> personal information. Yeah. And again, that's more likely to happen if there's that connection that I've been speaking about that relates to the art of medicine. And so this is very clear to me that to have the best outcomes for health in this country, 
the healthcare workforce needs to reflect the overall population. And since America is getting older, browner, um, in a lot of ways, much more diverse, we need to have a workforce and healthcare that reflects that. And so the gift from Bloomberg was predicated upon his desire to help change that, to help make sure that there are going to be more black doctors. And the financial challenges are a huge part of it. And that's what his gift is meant to help us address. So it's an extraordinary, it was an extraordinary gift. And I think it's going to have a huge impact. Now, we have a lot of listeners and our whole thing is to bring as much value as possible. And we have some people that are the heads of universities or medical schools that may not have as solid of a brand as Meharry. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give them in branding? Uh, I would say they should really think about uh, assumptionless, <laughs> assumptionless mentorship and engagement. And I say this because early on in my career, when I was often the only African American in a class, when I when I was a chemistry major at Harvard, uh, oftentimes I was the only black student in those advanced classes. Uh, when I got into my research at Oxford, I was definitely the only black person sometimes in these large immunology conferences. And what I noticed was that sometimes people were making assumptions about my motivations for wanting to be a scientist that were different than their white colleagues. So I found myself telling people that I decided to become a scientist for the same reasons that you did. I have an insatiable curiosity about the world around me. I like to make discoveries that impact the health of my fellow human beings. Those are my motivations. So you should treat me in exactly the same way as you treat everybody else because my motivations are the same. But oftentimes I've noticed in majority white institutions that there are assumptions about the motivations, the abilities, uh, or even you know the 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 capacity to grow and learn that are made about people of color that are not made about. So I've been advising people, don't make assumptions other than this person is motivated for the same reason as your white students or white colleagues. Uh, and oftentimes when I was uh, at Johns Hopkins all those years, whenever anything came up that had to do with black folks, I was the only black a professor on the faculty in basic sciences, there were 300 of us, the dean would always call on me because he assumed <laughs> that it was a, if it was a Black issue, his Black professor should be the one trying to help him solve it. And one of the things I will never forget is that one day, my department chair, Dr. August, who was just a, a tremendous uh, mentor, says, James, I need you to come with me. I said, OK. He took me to the dean's office and I sat down uh, and I listened to my department chair tell the dean, it's unfair to ask James to always be the one to deal with minority issues. He's trying to get his career started like everybody else. You need to leave him alone. That's what my department chair said to the dean, okay? Mm -hmm. I, will never, I will never forget it. And my admiration uh, uh, and, and for Dr. August went up orders of magnitude because, first of all, I didn't even know he recognized that as a, as a thing. And so one day, again, he just asked me to come with him. I didn't know what was going on because, you know, if your department chair takes you to the dean's office, you don't know what's about to happen, right? <laughs> right. But he actually told the dean, you need to leave James alone. He's trying to get his career started like everybody else. It was just the most remarkable. So, so I think that part of my advice to people in leadership in an academic setting is to not make assumptions about people of color that you wouldn't make it by anybody else because our motivations are the same. We're, we're driven to do what we do for the same reasons as anybody else does. And these assumptions that are made about us can get into the, get in the way of, 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 of full incorporation into the programs, the you know, challenges, all that. So that would be my advice. That's one piece of advice that I write. 
That, that's a really good one. Now you said something about your insatiable curiosity. Yes. Do you see a direct correlation between successful people and an insatiable curiosity? I think that for those of us who are scientists, I would argue that all of us have that in common, that what drives us is um, a burning question that we, we, I have one more question, in fact, that I want to answer before I hang up my pipette for good. Uh, and it has to do with why HIV has been such a challenge to our immune system. I have a hypothesis as to why that is. And even now as president, I don't have any time, honestly, to be in the lab, but I'm vicariously doing this work to some of the people I recruited. And that will probably never go away. When I was a child, whenever I got a toy, Todd, I'd take it apart. First thing I do is take it apart. I wanna know how it worked. And I, sometimes I couldn't put them back together, but that didn't matter because I wanted to know, well, how did this work, right? I mean, you know, so I just, I've always had this curiosity about the world around me. And I think that, that most scientists, whether you're a physicist, mathematician, biologist, immunologist, that's what drives all of us is that we have this burning desire or question we'd like to try to answer. We want, we want to understand the order of things. and. That's whether you're black, white, Asian, in between, for scientists at least, that's something we all have in common. Now, as an adult, do you break things down whenever you have a problem or whenever you have something? Do you break it down to us? Absolutely. To us? Absolutely. So when I'm when I'm uh, trying to solve a problem that relates to leading the institution, uh, I'm old fashioned. I will just take my notepad and start to break that things down into the smallest components possible in terms of the players I have available to put on the field. I mean, yes, yes. I'm still doing that. You're right. It makes <laughs> sense. Now, you've been doing some innovative things around HIV to present, prevent and stop the spread of it. Can you talk about your research, your inventions, your patents? Uh, well, uh, so I have 11 patents and one of them resulted in a, a, a FDA approved drug from from uh, from one of the Genentech. And so when I was a graduate student at Oxford, I was given a very challenging project by my mentor. So I have to I have to teach you a little bit of immunology, Todd. It won't don't worry, it won't, it won't be it won't be too much, but I love it. So, <laughs> so one of the most interesting things about our immune system it's designed to distinguish those things that belong in our body from those things that don't. So whenever something is introduced into our bodies that doesn't belong there, our immune system recognizes that as foreign and it goes to work to remove it. But it turns out that one part of our immune system also needs to see self and non-self at the same time. It's, I don't know why it evolved that way, no one seems to know, but T cells in our bodies that are responsible for eliminating viruses, they need to see something from the virus and something from self at the same time. So my thesis project was to determine whether or not the self, non-self formed a complex to be recognized or they recognized separately. It may seem like a trivial question, but it actually turns out to be on a genetics level quite complex. But my assignment was, because my mentor thought that they formed a complex. He charged with me with finding evidence that self and non-self complex, and that's what the immune system recognized. And to make a long story short, uh, one of the tools I used to prove this was something called monoclonal antibodies. Antibodies have the ability to recognize very, very discrete things. So I wanted to see if I could find an antibody that would only bind to self when the non-self was also present. And if that were true, that would mean that it's binding to a complex. But in doing that research, we discovered something called adhesion molecules. And these are proteins that do something, that's why they're called this, they allow cells to stick together so they can communicate. Well, it turns out that this communication between cells is fundamental to how the immune system works. And I got the idea that these antibodies that recognize adhesion molecules might be able to suppress immune responses. And we tested it and sure enough, they did. So there was a patent issued for one of these 
and psoriasis is a uh, is not a usually a fatal, but it's a very challenging autoimmune disease caused by our T cells attacking our skin. So Genentech licensed one of our patented antibodies, and it turned out to be a terrific treatment for psoriasis, and it was put on the market for that. But it also <laughs> turned out that by immunosuppressing the T cells, it allowed viruses that are normally in our body to grow in the brain. So it caused this side effect uh, in the brain and was taken off the market. But my research has been trying to understand how cells talk to each other. And later on, that same uh, kind of research is being done to understand how HIV attaches to cells and gets into cells. So that's been my research all these since 1986, is trying to understand how HIV uses these molecules to get into cells and then using that knowledge to block it from getting into cells. And that's what we've, we've been doing. And let me just say before I stop that one of our most, one of our biggest discoveries was that cholesterol of all things is required for HIV to enter into cells. And it turns out that by modulating the cholesterol content of either HIV or the cells that it infects, you can actually block infection. And after we made our discovery known, it turns out that lots of viruses, not just HIV, but lots of viruses do the same thing. So it turned out to be a pretty major discovery. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Dr. Hildreth, it was, it was a true honor to speak with you. Your achievements speak for themselves, but it seems like you're a good man. And I appreciate that more than anything else. Well, thank you, Todd. And I appreciate that compliment more than any other, actually. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, is there anything that you wish I would have asked you? Well, you didn't ask me anything about COVID-19, which is a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But <laughs> I do want to say to your listeners that this is, this is a very serious challenge. Mm -hmm. And what I really want to dispel is this idea that if you're young and healthy, that this is not a problem for you. And, you know, if you're in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, this is definitely a problem for you. And more importantly, you probably have someone you love, someone you really care about, who may be older and in a more vulnerable population. Yeah. So pr by protecting yourself from this virus, you're also protecting them. So let's please keep doing those things that we need to do to keep the virus in check. And uh, we'll all be better for that. Thank you for that. And I think that's a great way to end. Thank you, Dr. Hildred. If we, if we <laughs> ever be of any service, we're all, we'll always be here to support you. Thank you, Todd. I appreciate you. I enjoyed talking with you today. Thank you. I, I enjoyed it as well. Thank you, Dr. Hildred. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care.